tonight? I said, do you have joy? Unspeakable joy. Has he been good to you? Do you love Jesus? Oh, come on. I mean, do you really love him? Is he your way maker? Is he your provider? Is he your healer? Was he there for you when nobody else was there for you? Is, has he been anybody's brother? Has he been anybody's mother? Has he been a father to the fatherless? Has he been there for you tonight, Calvary? Come on and lift your hands toward the heavens. Lift your hands and open your mouth and just start to thank him. Come on, let's enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise. Don't wait on the next thing. I know I got to preach tonight, but let's just invite him. Let's say, Lord, speak to me. Lord, speak to me. Lord, open up heaven over this church. Hey, God, have your way tonight, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Come on, Calvary Christian Center. Let's have an encounter with him tonight. Let faith arise in this place. Let faith arise in this place. Stir up the gift, oh God. Oh, stir up the gift tonight, Jesus. We worship you. We worship you. Come on, close your eyes all across this building. I looked over to my wife tonight and I said, baby, I don't know what I'm going to say when I get up, but I feel like God's going to do something very special tonight. And that's why I haven't even opened my notes yet, because I feel the presence of God in this place. I feel like God's about to reunite you with a great purpose, with a great dream, with a great miracle. Come on, some of you have walked away from some promises, and I feel like tonight God's going to stir that promise back up on the inside of you. With every, every, every hand lifted, every eye closed, just you and God. Come on, just you and the Lord. We love you, Jesus. We worship you, oh God. Come on, if you're watching all across the world right now on live stream, right up in your living room, revival can hit your home. It can hit your marriage. You ought to grab your wife or your husband by the hand, and you ought to start crying out the name of Jesus. Because if his name be lifted up, the Bible said he'll draw all men. That means everything that you need, he'll bring to you. At the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Come on, sickness is bowing tonight. Depression is bowing tonight. Fear is bowing tonight. Insecurity is bowing tonight. Your struggle is bowing tonight. Have a moment with Jesus. Just you and Jesus. I'll shorten my sermon for this. Just you and Jesus. Because I'm going to tell you, you being in his presence is better than being in a preacher's presence. So you get in the presence of Jesus right now. No song to drive you. Sing a new song to the Lord. Don't hide behind emotion, just you and Jesus. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. Now here's what I want you to do as you're meditating in this moment. I know this is different. I've never started off a service like this ever before here. I want you to get a thing in your mind that you're believing God for. I want you to get something in your mind that you're believing God for. I want you to be very specific with it. Every musician, every singer, every usher, every pastor, every staff member, I want you to close your eyes and get something in your mind you're believing God for. Maybe it's something, maybe you got to go back five years, something you've walked away from. Maybe it's a miracle you were believing for that you gave up on. Maybe it's a dream. Maybe it's a ministry. Maybe, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is that you have, I want you to get that in your mind in this moment. 
I heard the Lord say tonight that he was going to stir up faith in this house. I even second guessed what I was going to preach tonight. I felt like I was under attack. I even texted Pastor Troy as I was studying before and said, I, I shouldn't even do this tonight. I, I want to do something else, but I think that it was an attack of the enemy because I feel like some dreams are coming back to life tonight. I feel tonight I can see us peering in the tomb of Lazarus and saying, come forth. Things that you've been believing for are coming forth tonight. Things that you've been asking God for, they're coming forth tonight. No more bondage, no more holding you back in Jesus' name. Find the place of your faith tonight. That child you were believing for, that job, the promotion, the ministry, the broken marriage you were believing for, and I want you to sit on it for just a moment. Now, if you've ever wondered what activated God, if you ever wondered what made heaven leap over the threshold down into the earth, if you ever wondered what it was, that made the angels in heaven say all. Oh. If you ever wondered how the Lord would move in your situation, I want to tell you that the key is in your mind right now. Your faith is what moves God. Your faith is what activates God. So what you're believing for right now has stirred heaven over this house. What you're believing God for right now is stirring up an atmosphere of praise an atmosphere of worship and I believe that tonight is a night of the supernatural do you believe it tonight shout yes <laughs> nothing moves God like faith nothing moves God like believing him for the impossible as you're facing your greatest pressure because you see, the truth is, you don't even know real faith until you've been under pressure. You, you, you don't know what faith is like until your back's been against the wall. And it looked as if it was over. But he will make a way for you. But real faith is only activated underneath the privilege of pressure. That's right, pressure is a privilege. Because the Bible says in the 12th chapter, in the third verse of the book of Romans, that he has dealt to each one of us the measure of faith. He said, what does that mean? Don't worry, I'm going to let you sit down in a minute, I promise. I ain't forgot about you. I did do that at a wedding one time. I did an entire wedding and I never let him sit down. Can you believe that? Somebody said, yeah, I believe it. I know you. The measure of faith means this. Everything you need, every ounce of faith that you need for the circumstance you're facing is already inside of you. Faith activates heaven and God would have never let you come into this earth without the thing that activates his hand. And so the moment you took your first breath on this earth, the measure was on the inside of you to move God in impossible circumstances, to stir up heaven on this earth, to believe God for the impossible. The moment you took your first breath, faith was in you, but also you were born in sin, shaped in its iniquity, and the enemy was there to put pressure on your faith. And as you grew older, you stopped believing like you used to. That's why Jesus says, come to me like a child, so that you can believe for the impossible again. It was at that place before your faith got put under bondage and before your faith got put in a box that you would believe God for anything. So tonight I want to start a series called Faith Under Pressure. Faith Under Pressure. And what do you do when faith is under pressure? When you feel like you don't know if you can believe any longer and you feel like your back's against the wall, what do you do when faith is under pressure? 
Let's pray. Lord, everybody in this room has got in their mind something they're believing you for. Everybody in this room has stepped into a place of the impossible. They have believed you that tonight you would do something to bring that faith promise to pass. So Lord, over the next three services, tonight and Sunday and next Wednesday, I pray that faith would arise in this church, that we would be reunited with our purpose, with our call, with our dream. And Lord, that we would believe you for the impossible again. Lord, I'm not interested in just preaching a normal sermon, going to church and leaving. Lord, I want to live the life you've called me to live. I've got a short while on this earth, and by God, I want to leave it all between the lines. So Lord, help us live life to the fullest that you've given us, not give in to status quo, but pursue the greatness that you have on the inside of us. Now Lord, I need you tonight. I know you don't need man, but I need you. I'm desperate for you. So Lord, you see hungry folk, fill us tonight in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. You did a wonderful job. Amos, Asaph, Abinadab, stay with me, please, bud. Y'all give it up for Amos back here. MD. I used to call him Abinadab, Asaph, every A name in the Bible, but Amos it is. Just play some of that sweet Jesus music for me tonight, and we'll see what the Lord does. How many of you ever had your faith under pressure? Come on, your back's never been against the wall where you had nothing to turn to but faith. I'm talking to someone tonight who hasn't believed for the impossible in a long time. Let me ask you, when's the last time that you believed for God for something that was impossible? When's the last time that you put your faith on a place where it required nothing but God? And there was no way you could do it on your own. I'm talking to somebody who's going through the motions tonight. You're living the status quo in the nine to five and you're wondering, is there anything more for me in this life? Is there anything greater? Have you ever been there? Have you ever just gone through the motions? I'll be honest, I have. Even as a preacher, I, I know what it feels like to just to feel like you're in the midst of status quo and you, you're just going through the motion. And I want to tell you that God's got something more for you and, and God's got something greater for you that is only activated through faith. Somebody shout faith. faith. This series, we're going to flip the script on pressure. We're going to flip it around because I believe that pressure produces acceleration. My goodness. So you can use the pressure you are facing to actually push you forward. Go with me to Mark chapter 2. This will be our text for tonight. And you're not going to want to miss Sunday. I am so excited about it. You can take me down a little bit in this monitor, wherever monitor I'm in. I'm getting a little feedback up here. Thank you so much. Don't you love our tech crew? They're awesome. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And again he entered Capernaum. Somebody say again. again. You need to underline that in your Bible because that's very important. I tell our church every Sunday, if you read the Bible, it'll talk to you. Read every portion of the Bible. The Bible says, and again he entered Capernaum. After some days, and it was heard. Somebody say there was a sound. It was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room, underline that, to receive them, not even near the door. So it seemed to be that there was no access to Jesus in this moment. Somebody say faith under pressure. And he preached the word to them. Jesus was preaching. He was having home church before church planting was even a fad. Jesus was having home church. Verse 3, then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. They removed the obstacles. So when they had broken through, somebody say they broke through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic man was laying. When Jesus saw their what? Faith. Saw their what? Faith. Jesus saw your faith tonight. 
He saw your faith tonight. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. He said, he said listen, get your tail up out of your bed and walk. That's the, that's the redneck version, okay? There's too many words in that verse, and I felt like making up my own. So Immediately, he got up. He went in the presence of them all. And they were amazed and glorified God. And they said this, say this with me. We never seen anything like this before. We've never seen anything like this before. This is a very common flannel book story that we all know very well. And though there are a lot of different ways that we can go about this, I want to look less at the paralytic man and I want to look more at the house and the people that brought the paralytic man to the house. Now let me establish this first tonight, that no matter who you are, or where you are, no matter what your race is, your political view, your bank account looks like, socially where you stand, I want to tell you this, that the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.11 that God took eternity and he put it in the heart of man. So the commonality between us all is there's a void in us that longs for the presence of God. We can all congregate around that commonality that inside of all of us there is a void for us to be underneath the mighty presence of God. And I'll tell you this, the presence of God is the genesis of your faith. It is the beginning of your faith. Watch Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 12. The Bible said in him, his presence, and through what? Faith in him we may enter God's presence with boldness and confidence. In his presence is where your faith begins. And so I want to go back to Mark chapter 2 and verse 1. The Bible said it was heard that Jesus was in the house. Tonight I want to preach to you a message called Jesus is in this house. Are you ready for this tonight? Come on, are you ready for the word tonight? I believe when Jesus walks in a room, everything changes. I believe that demons tremble when Jesus is in the room. I believe that Jesus dethrones every authority. I believe Jesus kicks sickness out of your body. I believe Jesus changes everything when he's in a house. And I don't care what you're in right now. If you get Jesus in the house, you can believe for anything. I don't care if you don't have a preacher, if you don't have, if you don't have a Bible, if you don't have a worship set. If you can get yourself in the presence of Jesus, you can believe God for the impossible. Somebody shout yes. yes. So here's what you can expect when you start living by faith that is under pressure. Number one, somebody say it with me, say, I experience overflow. How many of you are ready for overflow tonight? Mark chapter two. Immediately the Bible said that many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them. Somebody said there was no more room. Not even near the door. Overflow. When you get in the presence of God, the first thing you can expect is overflow. 1 Timothy 1.14, the Bible says, The grace of our Lord overflowed for me with what? Faith. With faith. Faith brings forth overflow. Now, the word overflow, it means to fill over the brim, to extend beyond the limits. This overflow was a consequence to only one conclusion. Something special was in the house. The reason the house was in the midst of overflow is because someone special was inside the house. This house had nothing special to offer. This was not a mansion. There was nothing special about this home. Matter of fact, the owner's names are not even mentioned in the story. But yet overflow was filling the house. They didn't have to be famous. They didn't have to have anything fancy. They just had to get one man in the house. And when one man got in the house, the whole atmosphere of the home changed. It was still the same house that it had always been. It was still one that was overlooked. But when Jesus got in the house, everything started to flood there and their house went into overflow because inside the house, they got the king of overflow. And the principle for you in this Christian walk is not for you to put it all on on the outside and let everybody think that you have it all together. The key is get the king of overflow on the inside and everything. Everybody will eventually see it on the outside. You may think tonight that you don't have much to offer. 
You may think that there's nothing about you that is good enough for your future. You may think that that thing you were believing for, that it's not for you. Matter of fact, I'm speaking to some people that have given up on your dream and you've given up on your future and you've given up on the things that God has called you because you felt like you weren't gifted enough and you felt like you weren't good enough and you always talk down to yourself and you struggle with insecurity and, and you're fighting against doubt every single day. I want to tell you tonight, if you will make getting Jesus in your house the priority of everything you do, if in him you will live, in him you move, and if in him you have your being if you will let Jesus be the center of everything that you do I don't care how unqualified you are Jesus will take that turn it around and you'll walk in overflow and it won't be about your gift and it won't be about how awesome you are it'll be about who's in the house somebody say Jesus in the house David was in the midst of turmoil David said, you prepare a table before me. Where at? So the table before me was in the midst of pressure. Oh, You fed me when I was under pressure. You provided for me when I was under pressure. You gave to me and brought provision in the midst of my pressure. There is something about God that you see that you can't see on the mountaintop, but you have to get in the valley of pressure to see it. David said, you prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies, in the midst of pressure. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup does what? It overflows. I'm trying to tell somebody tonight, there's overflow in the midst of pressure. You can be right up underneath hell and heaven can pour out over you. There is overflow in the midst of pressure. Because where Jesus is, overflow is inevitable. Now the truth is, we each have our own limit. <laughs> Some of us are more limited than others. That ain't your time to hit your spouse now. That's not very nice. But here's the deal. Faith brings the overflow. Here's, I wish I had a cup. Your cup is your life and your limit is the top. That's your limit. That's what you can do. Faith brings the overflow, the extra water, the water that doesn't come from you, that is only produced from heaven, because faith only activates God. And I'm trying to tell you tonight, Calvary Christian Center, listen to me, if you are not living in faith, you're not living in overflow. If you're not believing God for something great, you are living by your own strength and by your own power. And then you are limited and you wonder why you feel frustrated all the time. And you wonder why you want to give up. And you wonder why you don't believe in yourself. It's because you're not in a place of overflow. But all you have to do tonight, it's really simple. I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm trying to show you that if you get in a place of faith, in the midst of your faith, God will bring the overflow and you can believe for anything. Because we're limited individuals, and there's only so much room that our gift can make for us. And, 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 and here's, here's what happens to pressure. Here's what happens. Because we are limited, yet sometimes we think we're God. Right? You know anybody that thinks they know everything? <laughs> Missy, you ain't allowed to say nothing. Pressure tempts you always to naturally use your own strength to manifest a supernatural promise. That's good. This is what happens. You start to get frustrated, so you naturally begin to produce, and you use your natural ability to begin to produce something that was supernaturally given. So what happens? You get frustrated, and you end up doing what? You quit. Because you are not the one that created your destiny. And your strength was never good enough to fulfill it anyways. God gave you something that required faith in order to achieve it so it would put you in a place where you had to call on him. David, when he was king of Israel, can I go off my notes for a second? David, when he was king of Israel, 
What was the first thing he did when he was king? David went and he got the Ark of the Covenant back, the presence of God, right? And he builds this new cart for it. And, and, and we all know that according to Numbers 15 that you're not supposed to build this cart and you're supposed to carry it on the shoulders of man because the glory of God was only supposed to go with the shoulders of man. And there's a whole sermon inside of that. But here, here David is and David's, they're all dancing and they're all praising and they're all excited. But I, I, I want to tell you this, David is not in faith in the moment. They're praising, they're dancing, they're shouting, they're all excited, but they're walking in obedience. That means you can still pray, shout, and dance and be in the midst of disobedience. And they're praising, and it's awesome, and all of a sudden the cart begins to, it hits a pothole. All of a sudden your faith hits a moment of what? Pressure. And all of a sudden everybody's wondering, what in the world is going on? I thought everything was going good, and my faith is under pressure, and my faith has hit a pothole, and my life is at a dead end, and God, I don't know what to do, and I can't sleep at night, and, I, and, I, and, I, and when, I wait, when, I, when I do go to sleep, I don't sleep well, and when I wake up, I wake up worried, and it was like everything was going good, but yet now for David, it's falling apart, and the Bible says that as it begins to tip, the ark begins to tip, what happens? Uzzah. A man named Uzzah, he reaches up to grab the ark, and the Bible says that he dies. The moment was dead. Do you know what Uzzah's name means in the Hebrew? Uzzah's name means the strength of man. Anytime you try to put your strength on what God wants to do in your life, something will die. And pressure tries to... Pressure tries to tempt you to put your hand on what God wants to do in your life. And anytime your hand gets on it, it cannot last. Faith under pressure is saying, look, Lord, I've come to the end of me. Jesus, no more me. I need you to fill me. I need you to move this mountain. I can't move it on my own. There's no strategy and there's no education and there's nothing. Lord, I need overflow and I need you to do it now. So the first thing that happens when your faith is under pressure, you get Jesus in the house and you'll experience overflow. Number two, you will find out soon that your miracle is still alive. Somebody say it's still alive. Your miracle is still alive. Jesus is in the middle of preaching the word. I feel like all this is a setup for this moment right here. This is so powerful. Verse three. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. Somebody said they broke through. And he said to the paralytic man, he said, I say to you, arise, take your bed and go to your house. The men bring this man on a stretcher and they see the blessing that is at the house. Now I want you to see this. Who knows how long they've been waiting to bring this man? Who knows for how many years they've been carrying this man from place to place to place to place to place. I'll tell you, it wasn't some random event for them to carry this man to Jesus. These guys, they had to have been little more than just acquaintances he met as they were getting slushies at the 7-Eleven. You can tell I got a four-year-old, a three-year-old, and a six-year-old. These men had carried this man around and nothing had changed yet. But they had yet to carry him in a house that Jesus was in. And so as they're carrying this man, they get to the place that Jesus is in and they look and they see overflow everywhere. What a wonderful sight it was to see the crowds of people getting healed, getting blessed, preaching of the word. It was a church service where you could not even get in the doors of the house. And they look and they could have been in awe of what God was doing for everybody else. There was no more room for them to get into this house. But faith always finds a way to break through. Faith always finds a way to get to the place that Jesus is at. So the Bible says in Mark 2 and verse 4, when they had broken through. Don't miss this. If you read the Bible, it'll talk to you. When who broke through? When who broke through? When who broke through? Yeah, I want to tell you that faith without works is dead. 
Faith without works is dead. Sometimes we pray, God, break me through, break me through, break me through, break me through. And God say, no, I want you to break through, peel back the roof. And when you peel it back, I'll be down here ready to do a miracle. But I need you to put some work with the faith. Because you see, sometimes I think we think that faith is laziness and it's far from that. Faith without works is dead. They broke through. Jesus was there. Sometimes you got to, well, pastor, what are you talking about? Jesus in the house. How do I break through? I mean, you've got to praise when you don't feel like praising. You got to pray when you don't feel like praying. You got to call out to God when you don't feel like calling out. Pastor, you mean sometimes you don't feel like calling out to God? Yes. But I want to see the God of the breakthrough. And it's not a breakthrough unless there's an obstacle. I, I'll talk to you over here. I said, it's not a breakthrough unless there's an obstacle. So if you want to see the God of breakthrough, your faith has got to get underneath some kind of pressure. And in the midst of that pressure, you have to be willing to say, God, I'll do whatever I can do, but you got to do the rest. If I got to peel the roof back, if I've got to kick doors in, if I've got to stay up and lose sleep to pray, if I got to show up to church early, if I've got to dance all over this place like David and have everybody say I'm crazy. God, I'll do whatever I have to do, but I need a breakthrough. Faith is your breakthrough weapon. I'm, I love shouting for breakthroughs. Ooh, bless God. I love shouting for breakthroughs. Shout for a breakthrough. One, two, three, shout. Yes! It's, woo, it's awesome. But breakthrough is in the faith of men and women that are willing to remove obstacles to get to Jesus. Remove the doubt to get to Jesus. Remove your stupid insecurity to get to Jesus. Remove the pride to get to Jesus. Remove your idols to get to Jesus. Faith is a sacrifice. But God has always inhabited man's sacrifice. Always inhabited your sacrifice. When you get the audacity and the fortitude on the inside of you to say, I'm not going to be denied. I'm not going to give up in this moment. That thing that you had in your mind, you've got to go back to a place that you say, God, I'm not giving up on that thing. I am not giving up because I believe that if I can just tear the roof back, that my miracle will still live. I believe it'll walk again if I can just tear something out of the way. I believe that I'm right around the corner, God, and I need you to do something to this miracle. I believe that if I'll put my works to it with your faith, that something supernatural can happen. Now watch this. There was a supernatural presence in the house, and there was a predicament outside the house. The roads were lined, the door jam was packed, the pressure was on. I want to tell somebody tonight, there's a promise on the other side of your predicament, don't give up. There's a promise on the other side of it, don't give up. They didn't let their predicament keep them from his presence. At some point, you got to want it bad enough to push past religion, to push past drama, to push past confusion, to push past weariness. At some point, you've got to want Jesus bad enough to stop playing church and start seeing Christ. At some point, you got to want him bad enough to say, if I don't have a preacher and if I don't have a song, then I'm still going to get in his presence and come hella high water, I'm going to find where Jesus is and do whatever I I have to do to get him in the house. I didn't come all this way to be denied. I fasted too much. I've sown too much. I've given in sacred season. I've given my tithe. I've been faithful when Pastor Troy has told me. I believe for more. I've shouted. I've praised. I've danced. I've sung every song there is to sing. Even the songs I don't know. I move my lips like I know them, God. But I'm talking to somebody that's, that's walked away from a dream. You've walked away from a prophetic word. You've walked away from ministry. You've walked away from a promise. Or you walked away from healing because you saw everybody else getting theirs and you didn't think you could get in. Wow. Faith is hard-headed. It never takes no as an answer. You know, 
I was a very gifted kid. Very gifted. Extremely gifted. You can ask my family. I was very gifted as a kid. I was. I really was. Very gifted. They always used to call me hard headed. <laughs> you see, with Jeremy, if you told me no, it just never worked. You know anybody that's hard headed? Women, you married to any hard-headed men? Yeah. Some of y'all ain't being honest. You know hard-headed people, and you the one you know. But I remember my, my mama, and, and, and bless their hearts, because um, I loved to talk even as a child. And in school, I got in trouble all the time for talking too much, and I was hard-headed. And the teacher told me I couldn't go to the bathroom um, um, uh, I, I was a very, I, I, I did something I really shouldn't have done, um, but let's just say I, would, I went anyways, okay? <laughs> and um, I, I was, I was hard-headed, and, and I, I wouldn't take no for an answer. And I just realized something as I was writing this message. I wasn't really hard-headed. I just had the gift of faith. I was gifted. I wasn't hard-headed. So the next time my wife calls me hard-headed, I've got the gift of faith. I'm not hard-headed. So the next time you get in an argument with your spouse, or excuse me, heated fellowship, and, and y'all and going at it, and, and, and your spouse looked at you and said, my oh God, you are so hard-headed. You just look at him and say, yeah, well, that redheaded pastor told me that I wasn't hard-headed, that this is the gift of faith. And I declare right now, you're going to agree with me by faith. Because faith is hard-headed and faith doesn't take no for an answer and faith doesn't give up and faith keeps pursuing and persistently pursuing the presence of God. I'll tell you what we need. We need Jesus in the house with some hard-headed faith that says, Lord, I need you so bad that I refuse to take no for an answer. They open the roof and they drop this man in. And what amazes me is that during this whole time, Jesus is continuing to preach. I know me when I preach, I got a little bit of that, that DDA stuff. <laughs> you get that? <laughs> And so when I preach, I see everything. I see folk sleep, pick their nose. I see folk not paying attention when I walk that way. They do like this. <laughs> babies crying. Oh, Lord, babies crying. But the whole time, Jesus keeps preaching the word. You got to think. I love bringing the Bible to life. You have to think that pulling the roof back was not a very silent process. <laughs> right? But you also have to think that Jesus knew exactly where they would pull the roof back. And he positioned his pulpit <laughs> right at the base of where they would drop him. And so here they are and they're lowering this man down. And watch what happens when Jesus, when you get Jesus in the house, his word becomes the landing place for your needs. His word becomes the landing place. Watch what verse 2 says. Go back to verse 2. The Bible says that they gathered together and there was no longer room and he preached the word to them. So when they dropped the paralyzed man down in the roof, they didn't just drop him anywhere. They dropped him on 
the word. They dropped him right on the word. And I want to tell you tonight that whatever needs you have, don't you drop it anywhere but on the word. Don't you drop it on your social media status because you need affirmation from somebody. Don't you drop it on your neighbor. Don't you drop your load on somebody else. But you drop it on the word and the, let the word do the work. Your neighbor can't do for you what the word can. Social media can't do for you what the word can. Complaining will never do for you what the word of God can do and those men strategically dropped this paralyzed man right on top of the word and then it was on baby drop it on the word they interrupted the miracle worker with their faith and the miracle worker erupted into miraculous wonders what I love about Jesus is he's omniscient he knows everything everything He knows it all. And I want to encourage somebody tonight with this. When Jesus picked the house, Jesus made sure that he picked the house that the roof could come off of. Don't you think Jesus didn't know they were coming? He was 100% man, yes, but he was 100% God. And he knew that there would be overflow. And he knew that there would be pressure. I'm telling you, God's not surprised by your pressure. God is not surprised by what you're facing. God is not surprised by the crowd that's holding you back. God's not surprised by your mountain. That's why he put faith on the inside of you so that when you could get to it, you would have the power to move it. But Jesus puts himself in a situation where he knew that the roof could have been removed. And I want to tell you all across this house tonight that Jesus will never place himself in unreachable scenarios for you. That Jesus will never put himself out of reach for you. Jesus will never be in a place that you can't touch him, that you can't reach out to him. Jeremiah says if you call unto him, he will answer you. You are a son and you are a daughter of God. And Jesus put himself there right where your need was and made himself accessible to you so that late in the midnight hour, you could call on Jesus when nobody was there for you and he'll be there and he'll show up for you. What am I telling you tonight? I'm saying if you got sickness you need to drop your sickness down on Rafa and say you'll be my healer if you've got lack you need to drop it down on provider Jehovah Jireh and say Lord you will provide I want to tell you, your miracle your dream it's not over it's not over Tear the roof back. Work harder. Pray more. Believe more. Fast more. Praise more. Worship more. And then let God do what only God can do. I want you to believe again. I don't need you to leave tonight saying he was good preacher. He was all right preacher. I like the sermon. I like that one line. I need you to leave tonight believing the God of the impossible moments. I need you to leave tonight knowing that God can lift you up and make something out of nothing. I'm going to let you go home on this. Your miracle's still alive. You get Jesus in the house. And the last thing is this, you'll see what you've never seen before. Don't miss this. Matthew 4.13. Watch. Jesus leaving Nazareth. He went and he lived in where? Capernaum. Now watch, watch. Luke 10. What did Capernaum do? Capernaum rejected Jesus' teaching and did not repent. Now back to our text, Mark 2 and verse 1. And again he entered Capernaum. Why, Pastor Troy, did he enter a dry, rejected, 
unbelieving place. After they had already rejected him, why would he go back to Capernaum again? I'll tell you why. Calvary Christian Center, I'll tell you why. Married family, I'll tell you why, single mother. I'll tell you why. Those of you that are believing for a miracle in your life, I'll tell you why. Because one family, one house said, Jesus, you can fill my house. Jesus, you can fill my church. Jesus, you can fill my marriage. Jesus, you can fill my children. I know our city's rejected you, and I know we've done bad to you, but Lord, don't pass us by. Oh God, if you're gonna stop somewhere, you can stop at my house. I'll entertain you, I'll talk to you, I'll worship you. A city that rejected him had a nasty mud house filled to capacity and overflow and a paralyzed man hanging from a chandelier and you thought Calvary was crazy. Wait till folks start hanging from the rafters. I'm telling you, you get Jesus in the house, it shifts everything, everything, everything. And all of a sudden, a dry and dormant and dead culture is brought to life because Jesus was welcomed in one house. One house said, Jesus, come in. And the city that rejected him flooded where Jesus was. God, if you're looking, use this house. At 1687 West Granada Boulevard, Ormond Beach, Florida, 32174, use this church, use my family, use the Dunn house. God, show up where men and women of faith will say, Jesus, you can come in my house. I know you're under pressure. I know it's hard. I know your faith's being tested, but don't use your own strength. Just say, Jesus, come in my house. Jesus, come in my church. Jesus, come in my worship. And immediately they said, we have never seen anything like this before. For we walk by faith and not by sight that God will do what no eye has seen or no ear is heard. I'm telling you, if you get Jesus in the house, if you'll fight past the pressure and you'll let Jesus come in and you'll worship him anyhow and you'll praise him anyhow, I promise you this, you will see stuff that you've never seen before. You will see doors open like you've never seen it before. Does anybody want to see that in this house tonight? Come on, stand to your feet all across this room and lift your hands up toward heaven and say, Jesus, come in my house. Come in my church. We worship you, Jesus. Come into this place. Fill this house. Fill our homes. Fill our marriages. Fill us tonight, oh God. We long for more of you. Church, I'm ready to see it. I'm ready to see everything God's promised come to pass. I'm ready to see you walk in victory. I'm ready to see you fight past the pressure. And if for nothing else tonight, be encouraged that when your faith is under pressure, there is provision in his presence. There's provision in his presence tonight. Come on, with every head bow and hand lifted toward heaven, just call on Jesus tonight. Say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I need you. Come into my house. Ah, thank you. Perform miracles. There is nothing that's impossible. And we're standing here only because.
Because Come you on, you move made mountains. Way. You move mountains. You cause walls. You cause walls to fall with your power. You perform miracles. Perform Did you get anything out of God's word tonight? Amen. When your faith is under pressure, get Jesus in the house. Well, what do I leave with tonight? What does that mean? What does that mean for me? That means when you go home, when you wake up, when you face that insecurity again, when you face that doubt, it's really simple. Start calling on the name of Jesus. Don't complain, but cry out for more of him pray more, seek his face more, I know that if Jesus is in the house, your miracle is still alive. Amen. Now listen, this Sunday I'm going to take you on a journey through the valleys of faith, starting in the life of Abraham. It's going to be a two-part deal that we're walking through Sunday and Wednesday. It's one that just recently we preached it at our church in Orlando, and, and it's like a mini Calvary there. Okay? We don't have these alien screen things. But we do have a cafeteria that we meet in. And I'm telling you, the place erupted with the glory of God like we had never seen before. And so I'm going to minister that Sunday, both services, and Wednesday night. And I would love for you to grab somebody and bring them in the house because we're going to stir up faith. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time together. We love you so much. You're so good to us. Thank you for being in this church. Now, Lord, when we leave here, let us not leave your presence here, but help us take your presence with us. Because, Lord, under pressure, what we need more than anything is the power of your presence. We love you so much, Jesus. In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen. 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 God bless you, and we'll see you Sunday morning. Come on.